Welcome to Relevant Revitalization, where you will find out the good, bad, and ugly of church revitalization. You will hear from pastors who have been through the revitalization experience, experts in the field, and much more, all with the goal of equipping, encouraging, and engaging you, your leadership, and your congregation to see God breathe life in your church. Now, let's get into some relevant revitalization. Welcome to the first episode of Relevant Revitalization. I'm your host, Matt Coyne. And for our first episode, I have the privilege of speaking to Dr. Jeff Orge. He is, he pretty much does anything when it comes to leadership. Uh, He teaches leadership preaching and uh, church ministry courses at Gateway Seminary. Uh, He speaks at conferences, other venues. He's uh, written many books on leadership and change. But the reason I wanted him to come on the show was to talk about his book, Leading Major Change in Your Ministry, a book, uh, Jeff, that has, it is a book that I have worn out through highlighting and underlining. It is my ter- go-to when talking about change, especially in the revitalization journey. So Jeff, again, thank you for being on today. How are you doing? Thank you for inviting me. And I'm doing great and glad to talk about change, especially glad to talk about change as it relates to revitalizing the church. Awesome. Well, I said a little bit about you, but how about you add, give us a little bit about your experience, your family, uh, passions, all that fun stuff. Well, I have uh, been involved in ministry for about 40 years, and I've done a number of different things. I planted a church. I pastored a traditional church, led a state convention, and now a seminary. But perhaps the thing that makes uh, the most impact in terms of the podcast today is I helped seminary, the Gateway Seminary relocate from the San Francisco Bay Area to Los Angeles, building new campuses, moving dozens and dozens of families, starting over in a new location with a new identity. And a lot of that is described in the book. So that's a little bit of my ministry background. And then I'm a father and a grandfather and a passionate fan of the Oregon Ducks Mm. and also searching for the world's best barbecue restaurant. So (laughs) those are some of my passions and hobbies that keep me busy when I'm not trying to lead change. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And uh, yeah, and again, I, I think s- your wisdom is, is it, God has really blessed you with this gift and this passion and knowledge and, and leading change. And part of revitalization, I mean, it, it's really revitalization and change really go hand in hand. If you're going to revitalize a church uh, and because this is our first episode, I want to make sure you all understand, you know, the way I define re- revitalization is God breathing new life into dying churches. And so there has to be a change. There has to be a change when it comes to that. You know, uh, Jeff, I didn't share too much about me, but I am a pastor in a small town of about 1,200 people uh, in northern Michigan with about three feet of snow right now. And it, it, it's rural ministry can be tough. I mean, any ministry can be tough, but you know, it's it's really discouraging when you see 15, 20 people in your church on a Sunday and, and wondering, God, what can we do? What can we do? And, and it has to come with change. So my first question, why do you believe change is necessary within the revitalization process? And would you go as far to say that change is biblical? I absolutely would say that leading change is biblical. Uh First of all, observe the creation that God made. He created a world that is perpetually changing. Uh, The days turn into nights. The four seasons move throughout the year. Uh, The world, the weather is different every day. God created a world that's ever changing and wants there to be a, a season, a transition, a movement about our lives as well. And then God brings about the greatest change of all when he brings conversion into our lives through Jesus Christ. And man, that is the most radical change anyone can experience personally. And then talking about the biblical aspect, Jesus actually addressed the issue of major change uh, in Matthew uh, chapter nine, when he talked about a series of illustrations we don't have time for on the podcast, but the last one, Jesus said, new wine can't be put into old wineskins. And the principle is this, a new movement of God cannot be held by the, by the constraints or the strictures or even the organizational design of a past movement. There has to be new wineskins. And so, yes, I believe change is biblical. 
I believe major change requires significant change. And I believe that uh, when God does something new, new wine, there has to be new wine skins created to facilitate and shape and guide that which God is doing in, in every generation. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought up the wine skins because I figured you would. <laughs> and so I appreciate you doing that. And yeah, so the first realization to come to is ch- change needs to happen to see God breathe new life, but it needs to be God honoring change. We need to, you know, we so often, I know in, in our church, when I first came here, I was trying to grasp at my own sinful pride. What can I do? What can Matt do? How can I breathe? No, no, no. It is God breathed life. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad you, you used, you know, the wineskins there. Now, considering change, you know, a pastor who's listening right now who is discouraged and understands change needs to happen. They're going, well, no, duh, change needs to happen. When praying through, which I want to make sure that that's, a given. There is no question about that. To pray through change, consider change in the church. Jeff, what wisdom can you share uh, to the pastor who's in that season? In other words, where do they begin and how do they navigate implementing, implementing change? The first and most important step is to clearly identify the mission of your church as it fulfills God's mission for the church. Now, in broad terms, God's mission for the church is the Great Commission in the spirit of the Great Commandment. And your church may say that in a unique way or a way that's very much connected to your local culture or to your uh, heritage, to your tradition, whatever. But you have to be able to articulate your mission in one simple sentence as it describes how you will fulfill the Great Commission in the spirit of the Great Commandment. Once you've done that, you've taken the first and most important step in revitalization and change because everything else comes out of that decision because it's not change is not about making things more comfortable, making things more culturally relevant, pleasing the people And change isn't necessarily even about becoming more attractive to your community. Change is about fulfilling God's mission Mm. and continually asking yourself, What do we have to do differently to bring ourselves into alignment with what it will require to fulfill God's mission in our context? And Matt, I can't say this more strongly enough. Until you know your mission and have clearly articulated it in the context of God's overarching mission for the church, you're not ready to make any change. Mm. Change is not about just looking at a menu and saying, oh, we need to fix the worship service or change the worship style or adjust our preaching methodology, or we need to create a different programming organizational structure, or we need to move the times of our services. None of that's relevant. Not until you've identified your mission. And then once you've identified that, then you start asking the questions, what worship time best suits our mission? What worship style best suits Mm -hmm. our mission? What preaching style best fulfills our mission? What program and organizational design will best fulfill our mission? And then you start making changes, not to accommodate comfort or to uh, accommodate people or to even be culturally connected or relevant, but instead change to fulfill the mission. And that is the fundamental issue about revitalization. What is our mission and how will we change to fulfill that mission? And do we have what I call the mission discipline to make that happen? Yeah, I listening to you speak that that's where so many of us fall short. We try to come up with the things and we forget. No, it begins with our mission and it begins with the scripture. It begins with scripture, it begins with the word of God. And then we, we fulfill our mission through that. So s- such a important reminder. And if anybody listening who hasn't never heard that, I, I hope you hear Jeff say it begins with the mission. It begins with the scripture. And going back to your comments at the beginning, Matt, when I say that a church must identify its unique mission in the overarching context of God's mission, your mission in a small town in northern Michigan is going to be different than the mission of a church where I preach Sunday in a very challenged community in Los Angeles. And it's going to be different in a very wealthy suburban church in Dallas. Mm. The, The mission of the church is different for each individual church, but it's always in the context of God's overarching mission 
for the church, which, as I've said, I believe can be encapsulated in the Great Com- Commission and the Great Commandment. You bring those two things together, and then you say, what does that look like in our community? If we really fulfilled God's mission in this community, what would it look like? One of the worst things you could do in a church like yours is try to become a church like some church in Southern California or some church in uh, Orlando or some church even in Seattle. Those are not your context, and your mission will take its own form in your context. But the hard reality is you have to determine what is our mission, what will we do to accomplish it, and then start making the changes necessary. And quite frank, frankly, those are difficult no matter what context you find yourself because churches always default to comfort and tradition, and they don't always default to mission and to the challenge of, of fulfilling that mission. Yeah. I, I Again, appreciate you adding that, adding that as well because – you know, one of the things our family likes to do every February, we make a trip down south and we visit some churches just to see what they're doing. You know, we just started upward at our church, so we're going to stop and see some churches who do upward. And we got to be careful because, I mean, we're going to be stopping at a church in Lexington, Kentucky. And like you said, I can't copy and paste what they're doing there, but we want to gain wisdom and insight. But again, that uh, I just appreciate you saying that. Well, you uh, want to gain, gain wisdom? And that's great. And you want to gain insight and that's great. And you want new ideas. That's great. And I'll tell you another thing you'll get from that trip. And that's inspiration. You'll see the work of God in other places and it motivates you to believe it really can happen in my place as well. Yeah. So there's not, there's nothing wrong with looking at other models. In fact, I teach at a seminary. That's what we do. There's nothing yeah. wrong with looking at other models, but just not cutting and pasting. Your language was good. Don't cut and paste. Instead, look for the principles and look for the encouragement, the ideas, and the inspiration that can come from those. Yeah, yeah. Now, when change comes, you know, and and we start implementing this major change in the church, I love how you say in your book, it's going to bring chaos. It's going to get messy. You know, it's it's something that it, you know, I want to make, you know, maybe it, it doesn't come with it. Maybe, but I think if we're honest, it does. <laughs> so, Jeff, my question for you is what advice do you have for pastors who are getting ready to lead major change? Maybe they're in the process of it. How? What advice do you have for, for them as they lead this change in their church as it well, gets I messy hate, and chaotic? <laughs> yes, I hate to say the same thing over again, but I'll just re- briefly say again, you have to be sure you're making the changes to fulfill the mission of God as it's to be done through your church. And once you're settled on that, then it makes the chaos and the difficulty manageable because you recognize that you're doing it for the eternal purpose of God. And you really believe that and you're really committed to that. So once you've settled that, it gives you a foundation you know, from which to work. But then secondly, I would say, uh, do some good study. And my book's at least a place to start on this. Do some good study on how people move through transition, which is their response to change, Mm -hmm. and then how you can help them do that. Because people process change with a sense of grief and loss, and they can be led through that with pastoral care and disciple making. But just because people are struggling or uh, are asking questions or even in opposition, doesn't mean that they are not that they that the change is wrong or that the change doesn't need to be implemented. Mm. It may simply be that God is creating an opportunity for you as a pastor to practice pastoral care and disciple making in the lives of these followers to get them to the place where they're embracing the changes that are needed to fulfill the mission. I have been through change as a church member and I have experienced those same feelings of grief and loss and uncertainty and challenge. And I was fortunate in that I had a really good pastor who gave me pastoral care and disciple making Mm. that led me to embrace the changes. And they ultimately became an opportunity for real growth in my life, but not initially. Initially, I was part of the chaos and the difficulty, but I grew through that and the change became a means by which uh, I became a better Christian and church member. And as a pastor, you have to recognize, yes, it's going to be chaotic and maybe messy, There may be some conflict and even difficulty, but see those as opportunities for pastoral care and disciple making, not as impediments to your personal vision being embraced by people. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I I know when I get pushed back, I 
struggle. This person's against me. This person doesn't like what I'm. No, no, no. They're and, and I love how you do say I use the this verbiage all the time. They're mourning. You know, I I followed a legacy pastor here 29 years, and I came in and and you know I I sure pray I did it in a God honoring way, but I implemented changes. And at first, I'm like everybody's against me, and then I read your book and I went, no, no, no. They're mourning a lot. Literally, they're mourning a death that they've known for years and years. And as pastors, we have to be sympathetic to that. And I, I do want to kind of add on. I'm I'm going to ask you a question <laughs> that I didn't send to you beforehand, but along these lines of how do we, through the change process, just remain humble servants? So, you know, when we do get that pushback or, or we do feel that, you know, that people are against us or on the other side, we do make a change. We do make a change. And if we're honest, it just falls flat on its face. And I've had to do that from the pulpit, apologize to my congregation and say, I'm sorry, I thought it was going to be a good change. It wasn't, please forgive me. So I guess I'm sorry to add that, but I'm just something you said there sparked that question. (laughs) Well, that's an excellent question. Let me answer it a a couple of different ways. First of all, you can remain uh, humble in the context of change when you recognize that you're just like the followers in your church. You're just like them when change is forced upon you or change is brought to you. Hmm. A lot of leaders think, oh, I embrace change. I love change. I'm a change agent. No, you're not. You're only that way when you're the initiator. Hmm. If change is being brought to you, you'll find yourself responding the very same way your followers do. So humble yourself and recognize that you're just like everyone else in dealing with change. And second, uh, understand as a pastor that you already have great skill in helping people manage change. You may not recognize it yet because you haven't made the equation. When people are going through change, they are experiencing grief and loss. Pastors are experts at this. Mm. We're experts at this. We know how to deal with people who are going through grief and loss because we know how to manage people through mourning. When someone has a death in their family, we know what to do. Well, a lot of change in church produces the same kind, although not to the level of a death in a family, but the same pattern of response of grief and loss, shock, anger, denial, as I talked about in the book, bargaining adjustment or exploration and adjustment. These are the phases or stages of grief that people move through when they're going through change in church. So you can humble yourself by remembering that you are. Uh, just like them. And you can humble yourself by working with them to understand their process and how you can guide them through it. But then I want to affirm you for Matt, what you just said about when you made a mistake. If the three most important words in a romantic relationship are, I love you, perhaps the three most important words in a leadership relationship are, I was wrong. Mm. When you can stand up and say, I was wrong. I led us a direction that wasn't profitable, and I'm sorry, I apologize, forgive me, can we move on? When church people hear that, first of all, they're astounded. Our leader is human and is willing to acknowledge it. And second, they will rally to you because Mm -hmm. they see in you humility and willingness to work with with them, not just to push your agenda forward at all costs. So I applaud you strongly for that. And when you lead major change, you will have some missteps along the way. No one gets it all the way right. When you make a mistake, admit it, own it, move on from it, and you'll be astounded at how people will follow you when you're honest about your mistakes. Yeah. Well, I I appreciate that affirmation. And yeah, I think it's, I pray every day to remain humble and teachable. I had a mentor who who said that every day, Matt, humble and teachable. And uh, it was, it's not easy. And I, and I know those who are listening, it's not easy to stand up because you push so hard for that change and you go, oh. Oh no, <laughs> but yeah. Well, Matt, so one wide. thing that helps me is I realized a few years ago that when I've made a mistake and I think I'm, and I need to stand up and own it or admit it. I used to think that when I did that, I'd be informing everyone of my mistake, but in reality, they already know it. They, they've already seen it. It, it. It's not news. It's just news that I'm willing to admit it. So that helps me also to remain humble and to be willing to admit it when I've been wrong. People already know it. They've already seen it. They just waiting for you to acknowledge it. That's all. Uh, Yeah. And I know it's tough. And again, I think what you write in your book is great encouragement and wisdom to make sure that 
we're remaining humble in that process. So now with change, uh, you know, touch uh, going back a little bit, how you talked about how just because someone push pushes back doesn't mean that they're against you. It just means they're mourning, but there are, there's going to be dissent within the change there. Most likely there are going to be people who push against you. And it's not because of mourning a loss, but because maybe doctrinally or theologically they're, they're They just disagree. How can a pastor Jeff navigate this conflict and tension as they pursue this major change? Well, again, we go back to the issue of mission. When, when you have clearly articulated your mission and you have connected the change directly to the mission, when someone is in open opposition to the mission, or excuse me, to the change, they're really not opposing the change. They're really opposing the mission. Hmm. And this is what, this is some of the hardest moments in pastoral leadership or in organizational leadership for me. And that is those people have to leave. Mm. The, these are not, um, and I talk about this in the book, that m- m- 90 plus percent of the people may be slow to adopt. They may be what I call laggards or slow adopters. They, 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 may, they may never fully embrace, but they're not really opposed. I'm not talking about those people. Those are people you just take with you as you yeah. make the change. But in that very small category of people who openly and intently resist the change, if the change is directly connected to the mission, they're not resisting the change. They're resisting the mission. They're disagreeing with you fundamentally for uh, of the purpose or reason that your church exists. And they're never going to be happy with you or with your church. And it would be better for everyone if they found a church that really aligned with their mission, what they believe the mission of the church should be, and they go there. And it's never easy to lose people from a church. And I never, ever wanted to lose anyone when I was a pastor. Yeah. I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a shepherd. I collect the sheep. I don't scatter the sheep. <laughs> I don't yeah. lose the sheep. But I learned, I learned over the years that sometimes there are a few people who just simply meet, need to know that they can't continue with you because of this difference of mission. And again, I'm not trying to get rid of people. I'm trying to hold on to people. I'm not trying to be divisive. I'm trying to be inclusive. But if it's about the mission, you can't have division about that. You can have division or discussion about options and programs and possibilities and ideas and thoughts. But if you're really making the change on the mission, people have to be willing to support that if they're going to be a part of your church. Yeah. That's one of those oof truth bombs right there you just shared. I, yeah. it, it is hard to come. So imagine a church who is dying, who has 15 or 20. The last thing you want to do is be losing somebody. Well, we already got 15 or 20, but it, it really is. And I know one of the topics that's going to be discussed a lot on this show is unity, unity in the body. And, you know, unity is not uniformity. And we have to remember that we are united in Christ. We're united as one. And, and as you said earlier in our conversation, my mission at, at, or not mine, but our mission at Rollins Church in Northern Michigan is different from a church in Orlando or Los Angeles. But our ultimate great mission, our great commission, our great command is all united in Christ. So I, I, oh, good. I want to to speak about this unity issue. Uh, Pastors etherealize unity way too much. Unity is about being, having commonality of mission. That's what gives the church unity. I, I mean, there are other Christians and other churches in my community that I'm in Christ with them, but I'm not on mission with them in my church. And I'm here at Gateway Seminary, where I have uh, 65% of our students are not uh, are, 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 are not Anglo. A vast majority of our faculty and staff are not Anglo. We come from the nations and peoples of the world. Mm. And yet we have a remarkable, in fact, an unbelievable unity. Why? Because we're unified about our mission. We know why we're here, and we are here to do that and that alone. And anything that contradicts the mission People aren't happy with, they find some other place to go or work because they know they won't be happy. Yeah. And so a mission is the unifying force in a church. Yes, we're in Christ. Yes, there's spiritual in, uh, unity. Yes, I understand that. But that spiritual unity of being in Christ is made effectual or effective by coming together around the common mission and getting something done together. That's what really gives us unity. 
So I'm going to stick on this unity because, again, something else you said, I'd love to hear you expound on this a little. Mm -hmm. Um, Unity, as you said, is, is we have to be careful the way we go about that. But my question for you is leading major change. So I guess we're still maybe in the descent or the, you know, those who are pushing back a little bit. But I always say, you know, unity is not uniformity, but it's not agreement either. I hear so often, you know, maybe in an elders meeting, for example, where you see, and again, I'm sure we'll talk about this more on this show, but you see, or you hear this, I don't agree, but I'll go along with the crowd. No, 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 no. We don't need that. That's not what we're talking about. So how do you deal with somebody? And and I know you touched on this some, maybe that this just isn't their church, but how do you deal with someone who comes to the pastor and goes, I don't agree with this at all but I want to be a united member, a unifying member. So I'm just going to go along with it. Do you have anything to touch on with that? Again, if they're willing to go along with me, I'm willing to take them with me. I, if they really mean that, if they're going to, if they're going to stop actively being in any kind of opposition to it, then, then I say we go along. But right. again, it, it's all about making change about the mission. For example, if a pastor comes to me and says, you know, well, I'm trying to lead the, the change, the worship style in my church. My question is why? Hmm. Why? Well, because I will like it better. It will be more comfortable. It will be more contemporary. It will be more suited to my style. Wrong, 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 and wrong. <laughs> the only reason to change the worship style of a church is to connect, is to is to fulfill the mission of your church, which is what? Can you articulate that mission in one sentence and show me what kind of worship style will finish fit this mission? And then do that. And so I guess, Matt, I'm I'm I know I'm hammering away on this a lot, but no. but a lot of pastors get frustrated because they're trying to make changes for extraneous reasons, primarily for comfort for the members or comfort for their own ministry or peer pressure to look like or act like other churches and not really make the decisions based on the mission. And when I have made mission-driven decisions, either in a church or here at the seminary, while every may not agree with all the methodology of those, that's fine. There's not disagreement, though, about what we're trying to accomplish and the end game that we're going for, and that we can find unity about. Yeah. And I've also learned as a leader to give a lot more flexibility about some of those things along the way, as long as the mission is clearly in view. And so identify the mission, make the changes based on the mission, and people who will go along with that, let them go. I have one illustration in the book about this. When we relocated a church early in my ministry from one site to another, I had a member who was very, very broken hearted about leaving the old church building. Mm -hmm. And we worked with him and helped him manage his grief. And he came to embrace and see why we were making the change. He never became an advocate, though, but he stopped being negative and he went along. He was riding on the bus. He wasn't helping drive the bus. He wasn't helping power the bus. He wasn't helping guide the bus, but he wasn't complaining in the back either. He was just sitting quietly. And when we got to the new location, he was sitting right there in the worship center, mm. ready for this first service. He was with us. Yeah. That's what I mean. You can take people along with you, even though they may not fully embrace, as long as they understand the mission and understand the changes related to the mission, and they're willing to go along, take them with you. I, I don't want to lose anyone. But if yeah. necessary, some people may need to leave only if they just simply say the mission of this church, as you're articulating it, I don't agree with it. Yeah. Then I would say, then my friend, as a Christian brother, you need to go find a church or a Christian sister, you know, go find a church that really identifies with your mission and busily serve God doing that. Yeah. We don't want to have division here about this. Man. Yeah, that's good. And I'm glad you keep hammering it away. <laughs> so thank yeah. you for that. Now, yeah. uh, you know, throughout the whole change process, you, you, again, you're hammering away. We, we our mission, but my other question, uh, and this is really one of my last questions for you is how do we glorify God through the whole change process? We continue to glorify him through the valleys and the mountains. How do we continue to do that? Well, I think two primary ways. Number one, by fulfilling his mission. God is glorified when people are reached with the gospel, when they are discipled into faith in Jesus Christ, and when they become active members of a church that's impacting a community, that brings glory to God. So the first way is by fulfilling the mission. But the second way is we bring glory to God 
by the way that we treat people along the way and in the process. Mm. We're pastors. Uh, we are people who practice pastoral care and we focus on disciple making. That's what we do. And so we bring glory to God ourselves by making sure that while we're staying on mission, we are demonstrating our pastoral responsibility in the lives of people. And then I would add a third way, and that is when it's all said and done, we bring glory to God by standing back and, sh- and saying, to God be the glory mm-hmm. to what he has done. Uh, we, we stand back and marvel at his work and magnify what he has accomplished and celebrate his successes more than bringing attention to ourselves. Yeah. Well, Jeff, before I get to my last question for you, uh, this is a time in the show where each week I'm going to offer to give away the the book of the author or the resource of the author or, or a, a resource of the person I'm talking to that they would like to, to give away. But you're going to hear me almost every week say this is only possible by a good friend of mine named Ryan, uh, who owns a promotion company named uh, Promotions Guy. Uh, and he is financially supporting this endeavor to give away these resources. Uh, and at the same time, you're also going to get a sample of one of the shirts he he prints. I'm not going to guarantee it, but I can almost guarantee these will be one of the softest shirts you've ever worn. But most importantly, Ryan loves the Lord. He loves the church and he loves to see God breathe new life into churches. So check him out, promotionsguide.com. Christian business, and he prints anything from golf balls to t-shirts uh, for your church, for your ministry, school, whatever that looks like. I can't thank him enough. Uh, again, so I'm going to be giving away leading major change in your ministry. And if you want this book, I'm not this gimmicky person, but I need to know you're interested. So I'm going to post something on Facebook and Instagram, just like that post. It's going to have a picture of the book, just like that post. So I know you're interested in it. And I'll reach out to the person who I'm going to be giving this away. And I'll be honest, some weeks, this is one of them. I'm probably going to be giving away multiple copies. So um, I just think it's such a vital book in the revitalization journey. Well, Jeff, again, thank you so much. I know you had to sit through that, but I want to make sure (laughs) that we get your book out there. Uh, But yeah, before you head out, I again, I know you have a busy schedule. I appreciate you sitting down and talking to me. But do you have any parting words of encouragement for our listeners, for those pastors who are in, I want to say, the trenches right now in that revitalization journey? I've been in ministry for 40 years. It's never been harder to be a pastor. Pastors are on the front line, and they're doing the most important work in the world, leading the church of Jesus Christ. And so I would say, Pastor, if you're leading revitalization right now, it is worth it. You are doing something that has eternal consequences and is going to make an eternal difference in the lives of people. So while it's discouraging some days, keep in focus the eternal contribution you're making and the eternal consequences of what you're doing. Thank God for you and don't give up the work that you're doing. It's vital and we appreciate you and keep at it. Amen. Well, thank you. And uh, finally, as I am going to probably say this every episode, My goal through this podcast is to equip, encourage, engage pastors in the revitalization journey. Please reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram. If you just want to chat about revitalization, if you need help with in any of these areas, or if you just want someone to talk to, I know how vital it is to have someone to talk to, to pray with, just to journey alongside with. Um, Please reach out to me. This is more than a podcast. Um, This is, as Jeff said, this is eternal consequential consequences. So we want to make sure we're bringing glory to God through it all. Well, thanks for joining us for this first episode of Relevant Revitalization. Until next time, I am Matt Coyne, 